The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders... Celeste? When a virtuoso musician vanishes in the middle of a performance... I'm calling the police. Investigators discover there's a killer waiting in the wings. Just leave me alone, please. And everyone is a suspect. Fingerprint time. Do you think this is a game? Do I look like a fool to you? Will they be able to penetrate a closed world of bitter rivalry and ambition to catch a killer? Do not let anyone in for any reason. Or will someone get away with murder? Like and subscribe. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Celeste is a young virtuoso cellist who just graduated top of her class from a music conservatory in the south of France. She's left the provinces behind and moved to the City of Lights, determined to make a name for herself as a soloist. And Celeste has come a long way in just two years. She's worked her way up the ranks to second cello in an illustrious orchestra. But she has her eyes on being first cello and is willing to do whatever it takes to be the best, even if it means making enemies along the way. Like the song says, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll, even if what you're playing is Mozart and Beethoven. Behind those lovely harmonies, the classical music world is cutthroat. Kind of reminds me of my time at the FBI, because to make it in an orchestra, you got to be driven, ruthless, and super talented. Celeste is all of the above, and that makes her fellow cello players nervous. Let's say they're highly strung. Yeah, she's made a few enemies, but that's the price you pay to be top of your game. Celeste is so focused on her music that she has no time for romance. But even if Celeste isn't looking for Mr. Wright, someone definitely has his eye on her. Celeste is young, talented, and beautiful, on her way to the lofty heights of the classical music world. Of course she has fans. Now maybe this is just the cop in me, but there's always something a little creepy about secret admirers. Sure, if my poetry was that lousy, I'd probably want to remain anonymous too. But flattering as it might be, you got to stay wise because your secret admirer could be just a few cheap rhymes away from becoming a stalker. And no one wants that kind of fan. It's opening night of the musical event of the season. And the opera house is packed with a who's who of Paris society. But tonight, Celeste is feeling under the weather. She lives by the words, the show must go on. So nothing short of a natural disaster will prevent her from picking up her bow for the final acts. When the opera resumes, Celeste is nowhere to be seen. And when the concert's over, she doesn't come back to the orchestra pit to get her instrument. It might not seem like a big deal, but you gotta remember, with musicians, their instruments are like their babies. They don't just leave them lying around. Not to mention, a cello like Celeste is worth several thousand dollars. She would never just leave it. There is definitely a bum note in this situation. 
Celeste? Celeste's friend Amelie knows that she isn't feeling well and thinks she might be resting backstage. Hmm? Have you seen Celeste? Who? Celeste Dimwit. Second cello. <laughs> Whatever, lady. If Celeste found a quiet place to rest during the intermission... Celeste? She might have fallen asleep. Are you back here? But the backstage service corridors are confusing to anyone unfamiliar with them, and the musicians rarely have any reason to venture there. Dominic? Dominic. So... Did you find my uh, runaway cellist? No, but I found her shoe lying in the hallway. Hello. So what? So that's weird, no? Who leaves their shoe lying in the hallway? I, I think there was blood. I Maybe we should call the police. Something terrible might have happened. <laughs> Don't be silly. It's a good riddance as far as I'm concerned. I'm calling the police. Inspector Javel has detective work in her blood. She's from a long line of police officers, stretching back to the days of Eugène Vidot, the first French detective and the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes. So, has Celeste ever done this before, left in the middle of a concert? No. Romantic problems? No. So here we have a musician who never misses a day of practice, let alone half a concert performance, and she has up and vanished. Her friends found her shoe near a trail of blood backstage. Show me where that shoe is. But if anyone can figure out what's going on, it's our inspector. She's a lot like Celeste herself, determined and meticulous, and nothing escapes her attention, like Dominic's attitude towards the situation. Chevelle sees right off the bat that her missing cello player has rivals. This is where I found the shoe. Don't touch that. There might be evidence. You two, go back to the rehearsal room and wait for me. Do not leave the building. It's down there. Deep in the backstage passageways, Inspector Javel discovers signs of a struggle. There's a streak of blood next to the abandoned shoe. Quite the night at the opera so far, isn't it? Now, we all know that in show business, things go on behind the scenes, and we all want a glimpse. The thing is, you rarely get one. But if you're in the crook catching business, your badge is a backstage pass to the darkest corners of human nature. And our inspector is shining a light into a very dark nook indeed. Looks like our missing cello player took her final bow. And this is clearly not some random thing. I mean, it's not like she strayed into a bad neighborhood. It's an opera house full of civilized people, right? If all of this is reminding you of a certain famous story, just remember, in real life, there are no phantoms, but there are killers. And there's one on the loose right now. Get me the medical examiner on the line and lock down the building. Do not let anyone in or out for any reason. To Inspector Javel, Celeste's murder has all the hallmarks of a sexually motivated crime. After a few years of working homicide, you learn how killers think and how they do things. And in Murder 101, you learn that killers almost always try to hide the body. I mean, it seems obvious, right? Celeste has been tied up and partially undressed. To me, this looks like the killer wants to send some kind of message. Whoever murdered Celeste has something to say. When Inspector Javel searches Celeste's locker, she finds the anonymous love letter. It could be a key clue. If she finds who wrote it, she might find Celeste's killer. Inspector Javel collects prints from everyone in the building as she takes their statements. 
It's going to be a long haul for our inspector. From an investigative point of view, it's a logistical nightmare. Everyone in the building is a suspect. I can't believe it. Why would someone do this to her? She can narrow things down a bit because whoever hid Celeste in the utility closet wasn't an audience member. They don't have access to backstage. But that still leaves over a hundred people. Musicians, stagehands, cleaning staff, managers, and any one of them could be the killer. But there's a technique we call containment. And just like it sounds, that means keeping all your suspects in one place like fish in a fish tank. So no one's going anywhere. Are you sure Celeste had no romantic issues? Maybe an ex-boyfriend that wanted to do her harm? Um, she had a casual thing with someone here a while ago, but I... Someone I here? Yeah, someone here. Do you think this is a game? Do you think that you and I was a game? Amelie tells Inspector Javel that Dominic and Celeste had been briefly involved a few months ago. Do I look like a fool to you? But the whole time they were sleeping together, Celeste had been trying to unseat Dominic as first cello. Never again! When Dominic found out, he was furious and broke off the affair. So you and Celeste had an affair, and when you broke up, you got a bit passionate. No, oh, yes. I'm an artist. An artist with a motive? How dare you suggest that I could possibly be capable of committing... She wanted your job, Dominic, and she humiliated you, correct? Yes, but I'll never be capable of committing such a... We're done now. Don't leave the building. Sex, ambition, jealousy. It's a classic emotional cocktail of the Molotov variety. Now, normally, Dominic would go from first cello to prime suspect, but there's one problem. Everyone knows our hot-headed friend was playing when Celeste went AWOL. He might have given her the heave-ho as a lover and a rival musician, but he didn't kill her and hide her in the utility closet. 24 hours into the investigation, Inspector Juvel gets a break. Um, well, I... I was just going out back to get some fresh air, and I saw them talking. When a violinist claims to have seen Celeste during the intermission, and Celeste wasn't alone. I didn't really want to get into it, so I just kind of turned around and walked the other direction. The violinist was probably the last person to see Celeste alive, but there's a problem. I didn't really get a clear look. She says she can't remember what the person with Celeste looked like. Is it a man? Woman? For cops, memory is both a blessing and a curse. People forget what they see. They second-guess themselves. Their memory fades. It's notoriously unreliable. But in any investigation, witnesses are also crucial. We need to know what they saw as accurately as possible. So sometimes, to get the old memory banks working, you need to try something a little outside the box. Have you ever been in a hypnotic state? You're joking, right? Not in the least. Just keep your eyes on the pen and relax. Go. Oh. Uh, it's you. Just um, leave me alone. I need some space here. Yeah, I can show you the way to the backstage door. Get some real air back there. How about it? No, that's OK. Just leave me alone, please. That was weird. Tell me what you saw. Um, it was a young guy. He looked like a stagehand. It's Inspector Chevelle's first solid lead. If Celeste was last seen with a stagehand, she can now focus her interviews on a specific group of people. OK, that's all for now. But don't leave the building. The coroner's preliminary report is ready. And the results are not what Inspector Javel was expecting. It turns out Celeste was not sexually assaulted, as she had initially assumed. When Inspector Javel was reading the coroner's report, something clicked. When she'd first arrived at the Opera House, she'd taken a mental snapshot of her surroundings and noticed the rigging used ropes tied in a very distinctive knot, the same knot used to tie up Celeste. This is what we call a major break. A witness thinks she saw Celeste talking to a stagehand. And those knots, <laughs> you don't see any musicians tying them. It seriously narrows down the suspect pool. 
Everything in this investigation is now pointing backstage, but that still leaves a lot of people. And our inspector needs more than finger pointing if she's gonna make an arrest. <clears throat> what can I do for her? Inspector Javel interviews the backstage staff one by one, starting with Victor, the stagehand she encountered when she was retracing Celeste's movements during the intermission. Can you explain to me why you were cleaning up a few feet away from my crime scene? I hate you, you know that? Victor tells Inspector Javel that it's normal for the backstage crew to have a few drinks during the performances. Ah, who cares? No one can hear us back here anyway. So full of themselves, the bourgeois, the musician. You know what? They'd be playing in a park without us. But we make more than them, so who cares, right? <laughs> the night of the concert, he was hanging out with his buddy Luke. Da -da, da -da, oh, God. Bar. When the police arrived looking for Celeste, Victor didn't want management to find out about their backstage activities, so he tried to clean up the mess. So you fellows don't exactly hang out with you musicians, I take it? Hell no. They make less than us, so they resent us. Even if we were making the same money, they'd still look down on us. And this friend of yours, Luke, uh, what did he get up to after your little refreshment break? Back to work, I guess. You'd have to ask him. Fingerprint time. Oh, and next time, you may want to spike your coffee with vodka. It has no smell. Where were you during intermission? Next on Inspector Javel's list is Victor's friend, Luke. I was taking a nap by the wardrobe area. Well, so what? Uh, everyone takes a nap there sometimes, away from the so-called music. Did you see her? No, I didn't see what's her name. Her name was Celeste, and you better get used to it because we're not done talking about her. Did anyone see you napping? How should I know? I was asleep. We all know people who mix work with a little pleasure, and though that might be against house rules, it ain't exactly criminal. Nothing wrong with wanting to end your shift on a high note, right? But this stagehand story is sounding a bit off key to Inspector Javel. He's a little too, let's say, cocky for somebody being questioned about a murder. And that gets her attention. Inspector Javel can't find anyone who saw Luke taking a nap during intermission. In fact, after his drink with Victor, no one can say for sure that they saw him at all during the window of time when Celeste vanished. Inspector Javel has now interviewed everyone who was there the night Celeste was murdered. And when she runs a fingerprint check on the stagehand Luke, she discovers he's been in trouble with the law before. Assault with a deadly weapon two years ago. Seven months in prison, victim a woman. On parole, got a backstage job through a government program. Luke's fingerprints are on items removed from the crime scene. But far more significantly, the prints on the anonymous love letter given to Celeste are also a match for Luke's. <clears throat> Miss my company, Inspector? Inspector Javel now has evidence that connects Luke directly to Celeste. Does any of this remind you of anything? So the pothead stagehand with the attitude has left his prints like a trail of breadcrumbs from the love letter to the utility closet. But so what? It's not proof of murder. This is what we call the dreaded circumstantial evidence, and it's the hardest thing to bring to court. Well, I do work there. You got any DNA proof? So while it might not look good for Luke, that's all it is, a bad-looking situation. And you can't cuff a guy on bad looks alone. If that were the case, Luke would have been incarcerated long ago. Inspector Javel is going to need some hard proof, or better yet, a confession. And that's when looking bad can work for an investigator. You use the circumstantial evidence to pressure a suspect by shoving that unflattering stuff in his face. And if he can't clean himself up convincingly, Inspector Javel might have a solid case. You make me want to sing because you're my everything. 
I got a kick out of messing with her. Highbrow type. Very well. But a witness saw you and Celeste together, and no one saw you napping backstage. So where were you? Napping, like I said. That string player, we work in the same place. Like, none of this amounts to mail. You seem pretty confident, so I imagine you won't object to be searching your locker. Look, <laughs> you can't do that. Yes, I can. So you like souvenirs, Luke? Inside Luke's locker, Inspector Javel finds Celeste's hair clip. I don't know how that got there. That was planted. We both know how it got there, don't we? You're under arrest for murder. With unmistakable evidence pointing to Luke as Celeste's murderer, Celeste. he knows there's no point denying the crime. OK, listen. Look, she had it coming. I just wanted to scare the poop. Those people always treat us like crap. Keep talking. If you come clean, maybe we'll be able to cut you a deal. Hey, golden tonsils, tatois. Shut it! I'm rehearsing tonight. Get out. She was so stuck up. Too sophisticated for someone like me, right? Luke tells Inspector Javel that Celeste stands for everything he hates in life, especially privilege and snobbery. But he just couldn't resist the way she played music. Luke couldn't bring himself to approach the beautiful and talented Celeste. And as his unrequited love grew, so did his frustration and resentment, until the day came when he decided to teach her a lesson. Who hasn't fallen for that person who's out of your league? Yeah, it's harsh, but most of us just suck it up and carry on. But some people just can't do that. I've seen this a hundred times in my line of work, that unrequited thing that goes from heartache to hatred in a most bloodthirsty way. Oh, it's you. Just leave me alone. I need some space Look, here. I can show you the way to the backstage door. Get some real air back there. Yeah. How about it, huh? I don't think so. Just go away, please. We're getting some air. Move. And don't bother screaming. No one can hear you here anyway. OK, OK, just don't hurt me. Like my letters, huh? I was, you got me kidding me. Let me go! Ah! Let me go! Hold your legs still. Hold them still. I tied the rope. Huh? Luke claims he tied Celeste up to buy himself a bit of time to skip town before she could raise the alarm. It's typical thinking when you're a crook who's gone too far. He says he just wanted to forget Celeste, leave her in the opera house all behind him. But he hadn't counted on the object of his hopeless adoration fighting back. Oh, yeah. Shut up! Luke tried to leave the opera house, but got cut off when Celeste's friend went backstage to look for her. So, he said we'd uh, cut a deal. Just be grateful we retired Madame Guillotine a while back. 
Luke is sentenced to 35 years in prison for second degree murder. Oh. What the hell? No deal. Take it from me, you can't count on mercy just because you fessed up to the deed. Murder will always be murder, and giving it up is no guarantee justice will go easy on you. Luke is going to be singing to himself for the rest of his days. Despite the tragedy, the show must go on, just as Celeste would have wanted. The orchestra plays a moving tribute concert in her memory. They say music is the gateway to the soul, and even a punk like Luke has one of those. But he fell for the kind of gal he knew would never have anything to do with him. And instead of staying in the wings, he took on the starring role as the villain in a tragedy. Murder has to begin sometime, and those harmonious strains from Celeste Cello planted the seed of discord in our tone-deaf killer. Love can drive anyone crazy, and when you know it's hopeless, it can drive you and the object of your affection right over the edge. But thankfully for everyone, our backstage killer won't be getting an encore anytime soon. The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, Texas is a wild place full of colorful personalities and deadly critters lurking around every dark corner. And when a heinous crime is committed... Well, murdering people ain't that hard. It's up to a former Texas Ranger to uncover the truth. Hey, Betty, wake up. Because things aren't always as they seem. Oh, my gosh, she's not breathing. In the Lone Star State. It's the summer of 1977, and the town of Lubbock in the great state of Texas is one hot place. Former rodeo star Dirk now runs a successful barber shop. Business is good, and he wants to hire a shampoo girl to help out. Betty is a former beauty queen with dreams of making it in Hollywood, but she ran out of money crossing the country. Are you looking for some help? Certainly am, darling. And finds herself stuck in small town Texas. Betty had the job before she even said hello. And it didn't take long before Dirk and Betty fell for each other. You ever thought about settling down one day, Betty? Maybe. Maybe, eh? Well, how do you like living in Lubbock? Is it your kind of town? I like it a lot, especially the people. And when Dirk finally pops the question, Betty says I do. Before long, the newlyweds settle into married life like a regular Dick and Jane. Take it out today, Betty. All right, I reckon you just go home and take the day to rest. Then. The next day, Betty remains at home while Dirk works his daily shift at the barber shop. I don't even know what's going down. Come on, man. Hey, Betty girl, we're home. All right, bring that on the table. Let's do this. Longhorns better win tonight, or I'm in deep on a couple of bets. <laughs> hey, Betty. Betty, you up? All right, let me go check on the old ball and chain, all right? All right, all right. Hey, Betty. Hey, Betty, wake up. Dwayne! Oh my gosh, she's not breathing! 
Those look like snake bites there, Dirk. Yeah, Brad, we gotta call an ambulance. Hack, right, we get an ambulance. Detective Harris, a former Texas Ranger, is called to the house because the circumstances surrounding Betty's death are suspicious. So you boys want to tell me what happened? Well, found this around back. When Betty picks up the trash. Maybe it bit her. Well, that there is a diamond back. Those are our killers. Maybe that's what got poor old Betty. Maybe. Maybe. Throughout my career, I've seen more murder victims than I can shake a Texas stick at. Poor old Betty's death looks accidental, all right. The snake bites that Dirk found could very well be the cause of death. But as Texans like to say, just because a chicken has wings don't mean it can fly. And until the coroner orders an autopsy, we'll just have to wait and see. The next day, the autopsy report lands on Detective Harris's desk. The coroner finds that Betty's system at the time of death contained large amounts of proteolytic enzymes, more commonly known as rattlesnake venom. And the series of bite marks are identified on her feet and ankles, indicating that she'd been bitten repeatedly by a snake. Western diamondback rattlesnakes, also known as Texas diamondbacks, are real nasty pieces of work. I've seen them in the flesh, and you do not want to mess with those suckers. Their venom can cause severe paralysis before shutting the cardiovascular system down. They're responsible for the most amount of snake bite fatalities in the U.S. of A. Searching for new leads, Detective Harris learns that Dirk and Betty's neighbor, Jane, saw Betty the day she died. And what time was that at? It was around 4. She was by the back door. She was taking out the garbage, and she was sweeping up. Dirk was still at the barber shop at 4 p.m. that day, so that gives him an alibi. And the fact that the rattlesnake skin was found at the back door where Betty's neighbor saw her sweeping up makes a logical connection, indicating that's where she was bitten by the snake. Detective Harris returns to Dirk and Betty's home to determine whether her rattlesnake bites were accidental or something more ominous was going on. The detective discovered an unsent letter written by Betty to her sister on the day before she died. In the letter, she writes about feeling ill, but her life here is great with Dirk, and she can't wait for her sister to come visit. Betty's death is ruled accidental, and for the investigating cops, it's pretty much case closed and time to crack a cold one. That's beer, y'all. But Detective Harris has a hunch. There's something hinky about Betty's death, and he continues digging. He learns Dirk was married before, and his first wife also died prematurely. Two dead wives. Well, that's unfortunate. You want to guess how the first one died? <laughs> Spider bite. So we've got one dead wife from a spider bite and the other from a snake bite. I mean, if Dirk was a zoologist or something, maybe. But a barber? I don't know. It seems a little weird, no? And by no, I mean yes. Four years earlier, Dirk came home from the good old San Antonio Rodeo Classic to discover his then wife, Annabelle. Annabelle. Lying Annabelle. motionless on the bed. My lord. The coroner's report concludes that Annabelle's death is accidental, caused by a southern black widow spider bite. Turns out that Dirk cashed in his first wife's $20,000 life insurance policy and bought himself a Corvette. Got something little for you there. Thank you. Hopefully this will help me get over the loss. What the insurance company investigating Annabelle's death didn't know was that two weeks before her death, she was badly injured in a car accident.
But despite the suspicious evidence, the car accident was ruled accidental and never investigated by authorities. Well, that'll be... With the information on Dirk's previous wife, Detective Harris is convinced that Betty's death was no accident. All right, then. I know times have changed, but come on, guys. A bloody hammer in the car, Annabella bashed up real bad, but Dirk looking perfectly fine, even though he claimed he threw himself clear from the moving vehicle. Obviously, the local authorities should have pursued a thorough investigation. Sloppy police work makes Steve an angry cowboy. So now it's a murder case, and rodeo man Dirk, well, y'all, he's the number one suspect. <laughs> While Dirk cuts hair at the barber shop, Detective Harris secretly bugs Dirk's home, hoping to find any evidence that can break the case wide open. This is where the real magic happens, baby. Is that the best line you got there, Dirk? You have to do better than that, boy. Police discover that Dirk is a connoisseur of the oldest profession in the world with a regular stream of prostitutes visiting him at his home. Armed with the evidence of the prostitutes, police now have enough to bring Dirk in on solicitation charges. So you like the ladies? Sure, I guess you could say that. This is where the real magic happens, baby. With Dirk in the hot seat, Detective Harris uses the opportunity to question him about the deaths of his two ex-wives. First a spider bite, then a snake bite. That seems like one of those coincidences, don't you think? Well, no, not really. I mean, there's razors all over this place. As a matter of fact, I think we're both pretty lucky that we ain't been bit and killed by one of these snakes already. Is that so? Yeah, that's so. Dirk plays the innocent dumb guy angle to a T. The investigators know he's hiding something and want to nab this guy real bad for murdering Betty. But right now, they need some hard evidence or it's back to haircuts, football, and hookers for Dirk. Harris brings Jane, the neighbor who was the last person to see Betty alive, back in for another round of questioning. I don't know why you brought me down here again. I told you everything you needed to know last time. Is that so? Tell me something, Jane. Why did I get the feeling you ain't giving me the whole picture? OK. I'll tell you the truth. Dirk paid me to lie. I really don't know where Betty was the day she died. I don't. I'm sorry. Now we're cooking with gas. This is the first break in the case and the first piece of evidence against Dirk, but it's still circumstantial. What Harris needs is something conclusive that ties Dirk to Betty's death. When Harris re-examines Betty's letter to her sister, this time with a focus on her handwriting. It's all over the place. He concludes that she was most likely under the influence of alcohol when she wrote it. So Dirk's alibi is falling apart by the second. We got the corrupted neighbor who offered an alibi for money. Betty's very intoxicated handwriting. I consider both of these discoveries as evidence of a cover-up. The widowed rodeo star who impatiently waits to collect his insurance payout is looking more and more guilty. Detective Harris meets with the insurance agent who issued the life insurance policy on Betty, hoping to dig something up on Dirk. This is the policy I issued. He took out Betty's policy within a week of their wedding. Really? Well, that seems quick. You can say that. M is for <laughs> wrong, motive, which has clearly been uncovered here. Now, that's not to say that all people who take out life insurance for their partners have the motive to murder them. But when you've got a situation with back-to-back -back policies, both paying out with freak accidents like spider bites and snake bites, then you have got to start connecting the dots. Meet 
Maurice. You know, I was out there at the Robinson's Ranch the other day looking for critters. He works in roadkill and pest removal and is a regular customer at Dirk's Barbershop. You know, I, I caught this spider the other day and I took it home. I looked it up in my old encyclopedia and I think I found a brand new spider. Do you think something like that they would name after me? Maurice the Spider. Maurice is a heavy drinker and spends most nights at the Dun Inn. Uh, you know, murdering people ain't that hard. No, sirree. My buddy's wife never even saw it coming. It was perfect. Perfect. Honestly, I mean, this Maurice is a real piece of work. I mean, who gets drunk starts telling a bunch of strangers about how you helped kill somebody? The perfect murder, no less. Here's a pro tip. It ain't perfect if you tell people about it. There's just no shortage of cold-blooded dummies out there. It never ceases to amaze me. An anonymous caller from the Dun Inn contacts the police and tells them about Maurice's story. So what can you tell me about the death of Dirk's wife, Betty? I really don't know what you're talking about, detective. I'm telling the truth. You gotta trust me. Do you know how much time you're gonna get if you're lying to me? Hard time. And I got friends who can make it happen. Let's try this again, Maurice. I just wanted to help. Maurice eventually buckles under the pressure and tells the police that he helped Dirk move his dead wife's body to the bedroom, but that he had nothing to do with the poisoning part. Did someone say poisoning? Well, that's interesting. I thought Betty died from a rattlesnake bite. I don't know. Maybe it's all my years at the FBI talking, but this cowboy Dirk, he's looking guilty as sin. Now they gotta uncover something that'll back Maurice's story up. Betty's body is exhumed, and a second autopsy is ordered. The authorities want to see if there were any other foreign toxins in her system, other than the venom produced by the Texas Diamondback. Alkyl, dimethyl, benzyl, ammonium chloride, sodium nitrate, Rubbing alcohol, blue dye, blue dye. Okay, let me think for a second. Where would you find a liquid substance that combined a very strong disinfectant that also included a large quantity of rubbing alcohol and blue dye? Come to think of it, I was at the barber just last week and I think I saw something that just might fit the bill. Armed with the results of the second autopsy, the insurance policy, the letter, the next door neighbor recanting her story, and the statements from Maurice, Detective Harris arrests Dirk for the murder of his wife, Betty. At Dirk's trial, Maurice reveals he did more than just help move the body and tells the court exactly how Betty died. So when I go to cry and grab this dead possum, look out, this big ugly diamond back was staring right at me. I figured it wasn't worth it. Called it a day and grabbed the cold one. Maurice has plenty of experience with critters, such as rattlesnakes, and it gives Dirk the idea of how he's going to execute the crime. Yeah, there's a lot of those rattlers around here, aren't there? Say, so you wouldn't know where I could, I could buy one of those, would you? Buy one? Yeah, you know, like some people, uh, they want to put it in a zoo or something like that, you know? Oh, well, that's easy. I can get you one of those down by the highway any day. All right. You gotta be kidding me. In all my years at the FBI, I have never come across a rattlesnake as a murder weapon. I mean, 
Full marks for originality here, that's for sure. But in terms of an intelligent approach, eh, not so much. Say, Dirk, I'm feeling a little crummy. I gotta go home and rest. Y'all talk it out today, Betty? All right, I reckon you just go home and take the day to rest then. When Betty falls ill at work, Dirk decides today is the day to put his plan into action. Maurice, it's Dirk. It's going down tonight. Betty, I brought you a doctor. Still all right? This is Dr. Moore. Uh... Dr. Mo, Mo, Morris. Howdy, ma'am. How you feeling there? Oh, geez, you heard you've been laid up? That's right. Well, you know what this doctor prescribes? Bourbon. This will fix you right up. You ready? Here you go. Yeah, yeah. Tilt her back now. Yeah. There, yeah. Yeah. That's the good stuff. Have some more, that's the doctor's prescription. It's fixing you. Yeah, yeah. You're feeling it work. Come on now. Yeah, that's right. There you go. Yeah. <coughs> oh, that sucker's angry, man. Oh, boy. All right, at least some of that for Daddy, all right? All right, take her feet. You get her drunk, tie her up in a chair, and put her feet in a box with a rattlesnake. Okay then, points for imagination, I guess. But the million dollar question is then, why bother using the hericide as a poison if you've already got a deadly rattlesnake that's actually bit her multiple times? Six hours after being bitten by the rattler, Betty is still alive, for now. Can't stand it. It's taking too long. I'm gonna go down to the barber shop and I'm gonna get something that's gonna move this along. You just wait here, all right? All right. Hey, Mo, what happened to the snake? Oh, uh, I'll find that for you by the time you get back. Yeah, you better, because we're gonna need that skin for evidence. Dirk's way of speeding up Betty's slow death is to feed her the hericide he uses at the barber shop. Worked real well last time. She's gonna die anyway. You're not soon enough. You should go get that snake skin and put it around back. All right. What we have here is a guy who is panicking because he's impatient. His nerves can't handle the weight, so he reverts to an MO that he's probably used before, the toxic disinfectant that he uses every day at work. I'll bet your bottom dollar that his first wife's spider bite had a little hericide in it as well. For his part in the crime, Maurice is sentenced to 15 years behind bars. Dirk is found guilty in the murder of his wife, Betty, and is sentenced to death. Here's a little dose of irony, Texas style. 
If Rodeo Man Dirk wasn't so impatient, he probably would have gotten away with murdering his wife, Betty. The rattlesnake bites would have eventually proved fatal, and since those nasty suckers are so common in Texas, nobody would have questioned the death. I guess the moral of the story is patience is a virtue.